a Hafler DH200 stereo power amplifier. This is a 200 watt per channel amplifier by, by the David Hafler company in USA. And uh, this was in for service. I actually have a pair of these units here. I have one working unit and I have one non-working. And uh, we're going to rebuild this amplifier. So, we know this thing has a problem. And uh, let's just check it out and see what's going on. I'm not even going to hook up any speakers to this thing right away because I'm going to show you. It does have a serious problem. Besides the obvious that the AC power cord does need to be replaced on this thing. This thing looks like it's been through a war. But um, we have a more serious problem than that. We have a DC voltage on the speaker terminals. So I'm just going to power this thing up. And unfortunately, this thing draws so much power, I can't put it on my very accurate blow the fuse when I power it up. Just the inrush current is going to uh, cause me a problem. So I'm going to grab my meter and I'll show you what's happening with this thing. So, if we hook up our meter to the speaker terminals, and I turn this thing on, watch what happens. Holy smoke! We have a major problem. We have a DC voltage problem. I got about 5 volts DC on the speaker outputs. And I've got almost the same on the other channel. I got 4.5 volts on one side. I got 3.7 on the other. So we have a, a biasing problem. This being a class B amplifier, we have two transistors that are for the positive signal and two transistors for the negative. Because that's how a class AB amplifier works. So we have a, a ground point and we have a positive supply 66 volts and we have a negative supply negative 66 volts. And ideally these and this is these are two separate amplifiers right we have a, a left channel or right channel whatever this is channel one we'll call it we have channel two they're completely independent of each other, other than the fact that they're both connected to the power supply. But they are completely separate from each other. We have our power transformer, we have our bridge rectifier down here, and we have our, our two main filter capacitors. Our voltage across two of them one hundred and thirty three volts. So yeah, if you Stick your fingers across those terminals there. You get a good wallop. You get a good wallop if you stick your finger across either of those terminals. And these are 10,000 microfarad capacitors, so I mean, they, they, they're going to store a, a lot of juice. They'll put you on your ass pretty quick. And I, and, I, and I mean, they can put you on your ass permanently if you're not careful. This unit does store enough energy that it could kill you if you were to make contact with the two terminals when it's energized. So. Uh, this unit, or, or a unit like this, does require a little bit of respect when you're working out because you can jolt yourself pretty good. But we shouldn't have any voltage. You know, if I if I put my ground probe on ground, I should not have any voltage on the speaker terminals. So the fact that I've got four volts on one side and I've got three and a half volts on the other indicates to me that we definitely have a problem in this amplifier, in both of them and it's causing the one transistor bank to be biased on when they should be both biased to cut off to keep the transistors just at that point where they're they're just biasing on but we have a positive bias somewhere on both sides and it's causing the positive transistor to stay in conduction and that will damage the speakers because there will be a DC voltage going through the speakers we can't have that so let's take a look at these amplifiers and see what's going on here and see why we've got a voltage. So when I turn off the switch, if we watch this thing, we'll see it actually as it discharges, the voltage is probably gonna go up. Go down and then it'll probably swing to the negative side. I 
I'm going to break this thing apart here. We can start just testing individual circuits and see what is causing our DC offset. And I'm actually shooting this video on my Sony um, AX100. This is my 4K camera, although I'm not shooting it in 4K because I don't really need to waste that amount of bandwidth uh, with the upload. But um, I picked up another one of those CX220s and I'll, I'll do a little video on that <laughs> because uh, I got burned by uh, by Craigslist on this and uh, I'll show you I'll show you it at some future time because we'll get a kick out of this my other CX220 the one that the HDMI connector packed it in on of course I repaired that in a video um, but I, I was figuring you know th those cameras are getting hard to get and it's it's nice it does a really good job for shooting my YouTube videos and uh, I found one on Craigslist so I picked one up off Craigslist and uh, got it home and then uh, you know it, it's brand new and my my son said well can I have your other camera because he see he says that I've got another one he says I, I want a camera to play around with I said here you you can take this one and play around with it and I handed him my uh, the one that I repaired the connector on and uh, so he takes the camera away and I, 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 I start shooting stuff on this thing and I, I'm playing the files back I thought this doesn't look right I look at the file spec what do you think shooting at 25 frames? It's a PAL format camera. The guy sold me a PAL format camera. It's like, well, what good is that? I mean, yeah, I can shoot my YouTube videos in it, but they'll be in 25 frames instead of 30 frames. So, um, yeah, so anyway, I'm shooting this one on my, um, my, high, my, my 4K camera dumbed down to... Uh, Dumb down to HG just because it's it's manual focus and I think it has a, a really good picture here. Anyway, back to this amplifier here. And it's hot. This thing is hot. I can feel energy. Hot chassis. It does not have a polarized plug and it does not have a ground plug. Let's just check this sucker out. It's turned off, right? But let's just check this sucker out for leakage because I can feel power on this heat sink when I touch it. So let's, uh, let's just check this out. I'm just gonna stick my, my negative probe here into the, into the ground pin. So we have a bit of leakage. Oh, no, wait a minute. We have a little more than that. Holy smoke. Check this out. Check this out. This is scary. Ground front on. We have 96 volts. 96 volts AC on the chassis of this bloody thing. We'll just turn the AC plugger on. We really have something that's leaking here, don't we? The thing's not even turned on. Okay, now it should be ground. This is why they invented the polarized plugs, folks. <laughs> now it's 0.8. This is why they invented the polarized plugs. We have AC leakage. In, in addition to having a big problem in this thing with DC voltage uh, uh, being fed out the, the uh, speaker terminals, we have, a, we have an isolation problem on here. And, I mean, we shouldn't have any leakage because this has got a power transformer. So the chassis itself should not be in any way at all connected to the AC power coming in. But uh, we've got leakage on here. But we'll figure that out. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, do a few tests on the driver board here. Yeah, this is cute. Somebody's got a little, they've done a little schematic, they've drawn a little circuits on here. The other the other one that I bought in here doesn't have that, but somebody's been somebody's been writing. They're going to PNP on here. The part number, PNP transistor, 1N5240, Zener at 10 volts. Somebody's been uh, somebody's being creative on this thing. Just writing notes down here on the board. I think somebody's working on this thing. At some point, somebody's been tinkering around with this amp. So, 
Someone's changed, uh, looks like someone's changed the diode in here. Someone's changed that diode, someone's changed that resistor. So it looks like that resistor has been pretty warm. Somebody's been changing parts in this thing. That's probably why it doesn't work. We have a we have an offset problem, but we've got two we've got two separate problems because these amplifiers are both um, they're it's what's called a monoblock design, so both sides have got problems. We got a voltage problem uh, causing a DC offset on both channels. What are the chances of that happening? To have two two separate power amplifiers that both have the same fault or have the same symptom. It's kind of, uh, you know, what are the chances? What are the chances of both separate power blocks having a similar problem causing a DC offset? I'm gonna go and look up and see if I can find any uh, circuit diagrams for this thing. It'd be a lot easier to figure it out with a schematic. So I dug up my schematic for this thing here. I'm just staring at the outputs. Many of these uh, hafflers were sold as a kit. They were put together by hobbyists. They were like the old Dynacos, right? So you could buy them as a kit or you could buy them factory assembled. And I don't know the origin of this, but I'm just doing some voltage measurements here. I noticed that there was a, a bias adjustment here which will bias, should bias the amplifier into cutoff. Uh, it's MOSFET output, not bipolar transistor, so these are actually MOSFETs on this unit. And by just adjusting this bias adjustment here, and it's got my voltage down to 2 volts. If I turn it up, it'll go up a bit. But um, we're going to do some voltage measurements on this thing and, and see what's up with it and then I'm going to get these capacitors and replace them just because they're old they should be replaced. There's only you know, four of them per channel. The miler ones aren't going to be a problem. It's just going to be the electrolytics that need to actually get replaced on them just because they dry out, right? So as I, I'm looking at the schematic here and I see we get a a resistor here, it's in the ground circuit and it biases the amp. It's R39, it's a it's a 0.5 ohm half watt resistor right here on the middle of the board here. And I'm just measuring stuff and as I put my meter on here, I got a voltage across that thing. 0.7 volts. The amp's turned off. Well, I shouldn't have anything. 0.5 ohms. That should be. Well, I shouldn't get a. I shouldn't get a measurement. I shouldn't get a warning that there's voltage there. It should measure up like like that. But I'm getting a voltage across here. I'm wondering if this resistor may have gone open. Let's uh, let's pull it and see whether that resistor is open. And maybe that's why this amp, the bias is out. And if this one's open, I bet you the same one's open on the other channel. Well, well, well here's the bottom of the board. And somebody's obviously been into here. There's some pretty sad looking excuses for soldering on this board. But anyway, the, the, the resistor I'm interested in is this big one right in the middle of the board here. So let's just remove one side of it so that we can measure it. Just heat it up and pop out one side. Okay, we have uh, one side of the resistor popped open. Now we can uh, check it with the meter into standard ohms mode here.
Damn. I do believe that that resistor is open. Let's change it. Now, I have another unit here. This one works. That I can use for references, voltage references and so forth. And I notice on this one here, it's not a, a one half ohm, it's a one ohm resistor that they've put in on this one. This one, this other one is a newer, a newer unit. So, I'm thinking because it uses a one ohm resistor instead of a half ohm resistor, even though the schematic calls for a half ohm resistor, well this half ohm resistor has gone open. That's a, yeah it is a half ohm that's in there. So uh, I'm going to put a one ohm resistor in instead of the, uh, I should put this thing on autofocus, I don't know why I leave it on manual. Yeah, I'll leave it on autofocus, then I'll have one less thing to worry about. Um, yeah, the, the other amp that I've got, it's just the same guy that owns this amp has two of them. So we had one that was dead and one that was working. And the, the one that's working actually has a, a problem on its own. It's a separate problem that I have to take a look at that. But the amplifier itself works. But this one here has got a major DC voltage on it. So I'm, I'm starting on this one first. So I kind of have the... I have the advantage of having two identical units sitting here. And when I look at the second one, um, they've actually got a couple of resistors in series to make up uh, one ohm. So I'm going to put a one ohm resistor in place of this half ohm. And we'll check this channel out and then we'll do the same on the other channel. And uh, that may be all we need to uh, get this thing up and running. resistor out of the way here so I can grab it, pull it out of the board. So there's our our dead resistor. If we put the meter on here, you'll see that it's open. Oh open. So now We'll replace it with a one ohm. Which is actually measuring 1.5. <laughs> I think my probably my leads. Yeah, we got about half an ohm on the leads. Anyway, close enough. We should be able to bias it with this no problem. It's a plated board, I gotta suck some solder out of here. Okay, now we'll just reattach the board here and then I can uh, check the amplifier out and see whether I've still got my DC voltage on this channel. If my DC voltage is gone on this channel, I can bet you that the problem on the other channel is the same. And I'll, I'll explain how I came to this conclusion. I'll show you the schematic here in a minute. But uh, without the schematic, this amplifier would have been a real, a real tough one to try and nail down. This unit went into another shop and the guy gave up on it. Told the customer it would cost him hundreds of dollars to fix it. 
and recommended that he walk away from it. And it's not costing hundreds of dollars to fix. It's a couple of resistors, looks like. That's all that's wrong with it. Unless there's something else drastically wrong with it, which I haven't found yet, but we'll, we'll find that out pretty quick here. As soon as I power this thing up. It's either gonna work or it's not, right? So. Reminds me of that big uh, honking Toshiba though that I had a while back that uh, all that was wrong with it was a resistor. Again, other techs have given up on it. Okay folks, we're ready to test this out. Let's first put the probe on the channel that is we know is bad. This is the other one over here. Okay, there's our voltage to the speakers, right? And here's the good channel that I just fixed. No voltage at all. Okay, now I've got the amp turned around here. We'll uh, again pull the, the heat sink off the side here so that I can work on this side. You can tell someone's put this thing together in a hurry, they've left out half the screws. And I'm pretty sure we're going to find that, the, that this side is exactly the same fault as the other. Because the symptom was the same. And if it's using that half ohm resistor like the other side used, which it is, it's right here, then uh, chances are that resistor is open and the replacement will be a 1 ohm because that's what they're using on the other amp. So here we go, let's just check this one here out and see if this one here is open. And this one's coming up at three and a half ohms. So, that's a little high. It's supposed to be 0.5, but it's measuring three and a half, which is already a bad sign. Let's disconnect one side and see if it's high. I think I may have mentioned the date that this was made. It's 1982, October 8th, 1982 was when this thing was made. I may have said 92 on the other side just because the 8 looked like a 9, but uh, not definitely 82, which puts it right into the right era, right? Yeah, that screw looks like it broke off. <laughs> Wonderful. This board doesn't look like it's had any reworking done on this one, like the other one. The other one definitely looked like somebody had been soldering on it, but this one here looks doesn't look like it's been played with. So maybe whoever worked on it got into the other channel and then gave up and never looked at this side. Just washed their hands of it. Okay, resistors unsoldered. Let's uh, take a quick measurement and see whether it's open, which it is. See, completely open. Another one. It's supposed to be half ohm. It's open. Let's change this one out. Same failure on both boards. So let's uh, just heat the board up here. Pull this resistor out. And there we go. Open. Open sesame. We got another one ohm here.
I know what the uh, owner of this is going to say when I phone him and tell him I got it working. He's going to say to me, how did you get it going so fast? And it's I'm, it's going to be so hard to resist to say because I know what I'm doing. I've always wanted to say that, you know. I've always wanted to say that to a customer when someone says, how did you manage to fix that thing so easy? Somebody else had it for a month and they, they told me it was junk and it couldn't be fixed. And you got it fixed in like a couple of hours. How could we do it? I, 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 always, I always wanted to say because I know what I'm doing. Ah! Whoever invented the slotted screw should be taken out back and beaten with a bamboo cane. Same goes whoever invented the Phillips screw. Okay, ready to test it. Power on. I don't see any DC voltage there. Oops. Let's check the other speaker terminal over here. I don't see any DC voltage there. Next, we hook it up to the scope to verify that we've got a signal. And then we can hook up some speakers and test this thing. Well, I have uh, sound on one channel. This channel's working here. I have no sound on this other channel yet, but I'm not getting the kind of power I thought I would get out of this thing. So I have to do a little more troubleshooting on this thing, but uh, at least the, uh, the DC voltage that we were experiencing on the speaker terminals is gone. So I can actually hook up speakers now to it without risk burning them out. But we still have some work to do on this amp. So what I'm finding now is I've got, I've got low output on one channel. This is the channel that the signal is weak. This is a MOSFET output transistor, so it's a driven a little differently than a conventional a trans, a, a bipolar transistor amp. So what we're going to do is we're going to check the signal from the drivers and see that we're getting proper drive. Looking at the, the print here, I'm going to go back and I'm going to... Now here's the resistor here that was open here in our bias circuit. And I'm going to look at the outputs from Q12 emitter and Q13 emitter and see how our outputs look. And if you notice, there's a resistor in line here. Uh, our, our DC voltage, if I zoom the camera back here a bit, you'll see this is our, our positive rail here. It comes in through this transistor, makes its way through this transistor and then to the negative rail. So if uh, this resistor were to go open, we, it, we would have a real problem with the biasing of this amplifier. Also, if these diodes here were to go bad, we could have a problem. But uh, let's let's concentrate on resistors first um, before I start looking at semis. Resistors are usually the cause of problems. Resistors in caps, but usually it's resistors, like in this case, this one that went open. So let's just get in there and check some voltages. And again, this is the amp. This side, someone's been working on this amp. I see a bunch of resistors that have been changed on here. There are different colors, like this one here, for example. You know, this one's been changed. And this one over here has been changed. So somebody's been into this unit and they've been just replacing parts left, right, and center. So there could be other bad parts in here that uh, whoever worked on it, or whoever was working on it, gave up. Okay, the R31 is down here. It's 220 ohms and it's good. This one could be bad. R38. Looks like it's been warm. R38 is, um, where is it? Oh, here we go. R38 is part of the output circuit. R37 and R38 are part of the output. So it's a shunt circuit. R37, R36, and R38. 
36, 37, and 38. The 36 is a 1 ohm, 37 and 38 are both 10 ohms. Let's just take a look at those resistors. They're low value. Here's our 1 ohm resistor here. It's measuring 1 ohm. Where's our other one? 36, 37, and 38. 36, 37 is right next to it here. And it is 10 ohms. And this one here, this one's 10 ohms. And it's 82 ohms. This 10 ohm resistor is open. Another resistor. And this one's a biggie. I'm not gonna, I'm probably not gonna have a 10 ohm at, what is this, about two watt? Oh, 36. Yeah, 10 ohms, two watts. Ugh, I might not have one of those, but let's just take a look and see. So here's the old burned resistor. That I've removed as you can see it's nicely toasted if we measure it it's supposed to be 10 ohms if I put the probes on here and measure this thing it's measuring up at 85 ohms probably gonna measure even higher than that I mean, just not touch it with my fingers 85 okay oh 85 K ohms <laughs> it's way open 85k ohms. Uh, I've got another one here. It's not the same form factor, but it's a 10 ohm, a little bit bigger. Say uh, 5 watt. It'll work. I just have to fit it in here, attach some wires to it, and solder it down to the board, and uh, it should be okay. We'll try that out. Let me just get some wires on here, and we'll wire it in. So, um, as I was working on the unit. I peered down through the board here and I spotted a wire that wasn't connected and it was the the gate drive for these MOSFETs where it solders on to point 10. Now that may have broken when I removed the board to replace R39 because we had a major DC offset and after replacing that of course my DC offset was gone I just didn't have any type of power I had a signal that uh, when I tried to increase the power it went distorted so I've just resoldered that wire where we attached the board I'm going to attach the heat sink here we'll test it and I bet you I got this thing going so I'll put it on scope here we'll take a look at our signal oh yeah we got lots of signal here let's hook up some speakers and uh, See how this thing sounds. There's one speaker. Oops, wire came off. And we'll get the speaker up. There it is, it's working. So we're just going to uh, monitor this uh, amp for a bit before sending it home. I've got the scope on there so I can look at the signals. There's no DC voltage on everything, which is good. And here we go. Forgot one last thing I got to do on this before I send it home. I got to change that power cord. That power cord is uh, that AC power cord. That's a fire waiting to happen. So we'll change that power cord and then we'll send this thing on its way. But it's testing out good. I've been running it at, at pretty much full power here for the last 45 minutes or so, and uh, it's been sounding great. You see what I mean when I say this thing's a fire waiting to happen? It's all melted i don't see any bare wires here yet but now that's got to go that's got to go so let's get that old cord out of the set here how we remove these things and just use a pair of pliers or something to squeeze down and just pull the strain relief out 
like that. And uh, I was going to put a, a heavier three prong cord on here, but I don't have a strain relief that will pass it, so I'm just going to replace it with what was already there. So we just bring the new cord into the back here, give it enough clearance to get to the front, and then we'll replace the strain relief. A little bit of coaxing, and it should go in. It's a tight fit. There we go, good as new. Now I just have to reattach the wires and what I'm going to do is I just I cut the other cord off in there. I'm just going to splice the wires and put some heat shrink on there. I'm not going to bother actually soldering it down to the switch. There's one. There we go. Line cord is now replaced. So one more test. Power on. Play. Let's try a different. Uh, let's try a different mini disc. I'm just using my little MZ1 mini disc player here to play some music. I have no idea what's on this disc. Another live recording. Some of you may have noticed that I only have one wire connected for my speaker. Well, my my speaker my speakers are actually paralleled on my on my Sony amp up here on the back of here. They're on the speaker A. It's turned off here, obviously, but my grounds are parallel together, so the two wires are tied together. So I don't need to hook both of them up because it's a common ground. So I can get by with just hooking up one wire for testing. That's why I haven't hooked up the other wire. The black and the green are the same. So this one's fixed. I have another Hafler here that I'm gonna look at now. It's the twin to this one and it, it works. There's no problem with it, but what, it's, what has happened is at one point in time, somebody had wired the over temperature cutout light as a pilot light because the pilot light in the switch had burned out. And then on a subsequent servicing, they replaced the power switch with a new power switch with a light on it. And the guy was concerned that, only that, that the protection light was coming on. So what did they do? They just cut the protection light. So he wants it working the way it's supposed to be working so that if the amp does go into an over temperature shutdown, the, power, the little over temp light will light. So I've got the schematic here. I have the schematic here. And I know how to wire it because it shows me right here. Right, if you, oh, wait a minute, gotta get my camera in focus here. Where's my focus, there we go. I'm in manual focus again, that's why, folks. Okay, here's our high temperature cutout. And as you can see, there are two thermal cutouts on the heat sinks, and basically a switch wired across them so that if either of the cutouts open, current will pass through and light up this neon lamp. And that way the operator knows the reason why the amplifier is not working is because it's in over temperature shutdown. And basically what had happened is somebody had cut this wire and they put it over to here so that whenever the power was turned on, the light would light up. And the last guy to work on it didn't know what it was, so he just cut it. Well, we're going to make it right. So let me get that one going here and then we'll show you that one and then we'll wind this video up because I think it's becoming drawn out and boring at this point. You guys can't be interested in looking at this old classic gear that much, can you? Certainly not as much as I enjoy working on this thing, and believe me, the video doesn't do it justice. I've spent a lot more time on this thing when the camera wasn't working, tracing through the schematic. Uh, maybe an explanation of what was the problem on this is in order too. I'm just gonna put, point the camera down here at the schematic so we can see and I can walk you through what the problem was. 
Okay, initially I had a DC voltage on the outputs here. I had about uh, five volts, I think it was, coming out on the outputs. So as I was looking at the circuitry, I found that the bias controller here had little effect. Actually, it had no effect. I was still being biased on, on both channels, like both of them. And these are two independent mono uh, units. So the, the chances of having two of them with the same fault are, are pretty slim. But as I'm going through the circuit, I found that my bias voltage here was incorrect. It, it, this is a ground reference. R39 is connected to ground. It, it, it's a ground return. And the voltage is coming up here should be almost zero volts because it's, it's, it's a low ohms resistor. It's only half an ohm. And I was getting some voltage here. So I then checked this resistor and I found that this resistor was open. So I changed and of course that returned, that, that returned my bias to the correct level, provided my ground reference for the, to bias the circuit. Then all this circuitry here, my bias circuitry started working and my voltage dropped to zero. I found that this resistor was open on both channels. So I replaced both of them. Okay, now my DC voltage that was coming out the speaker terminals is gone, which is a good thing because you don't want DC voltage on your speakers. It's a good way to burn out your voice coils. Then I found that I had severe distortion on one channel and didn't get much volume. You could turn it up and it would, you'd get a little bit of volume, but it would just go distorted and wouldn't have any oomph. The other channel, I had no sound. So I, I couldn't figure out why I had no sound until I realized what the problem was, was the RCA plug here was bad. And when I wiggled it, the sound cut in. Inside here, the little spring contacts that grip down on the pin were sprung. So I had to tighten them. That fixed that problem. Back to the first channel. I start working on the first channel and I'm getting distortion. I start making some more measurements and I find that this resistor here, R38, has gone open. Whoops. Can't focus quite that sh close. R38, which was a 2 watt 10 ohm resistor, has gone open. This one was kind of obvious, so looking at it, this is what the side that I saw. And it kind of looked a bit burned. When I measured it, of course, it was 10 ohms and it was measuring open. So I cut it out of the circuit and found, yeah, it's completely open. And as you can see, if you look at it now, you can see that the bottom half, it's actually burned quite badly. So I replaced that resistor with a, I put a 5 watt in because that's all I had was a 5 watt. And that corrected that problem. But I still wasn't getting much in the way of output. So I started checking some voltages and I found that this output transistor here wasn't, where are we here? This set wasn't working. I was getting waveform from one side, but I wasn't getting any waveform from the other. And as I, as I looked closer, I found that the wire here were from the, from the heat sink, because the, the transistors are mounted on a heat sink. The wire where it's connected here at, um, at connection point number 10, the wire was actually broken off the board. Now that may have been, as I explained before, that may have been from when I was, when I had the board off here, because I had to take this board out to replace this initial first resistor. I didn't have to take it out to replace this one because I just cut it out on top and, and tied it down to the, 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 uh, the wires that were still sticking up. But it may have broken when I had the board out or it may have been broken from the previous servicer when it was put back in and I didn't see it because it wasn't like sitting free. It was just it was like when you twist a wire back and forth and it snapped, but it's just hanging on by the insulation, basically. The insulation was holding it down to the board uh, where it had been kind of, uh, I guess, stuck in with some glue or, or some uh, rosin or something. Anyway, it was open. Resoldered that, full power, units working like a jewel. Uh, changed the power cord because the power cord was all ratty, and this one's ready to go. Let's get on to the other one. So here's the other one. As you can see, this is a much newer looking unit. And someone's just cut this wire. This is for the speaker protection. So I just basically have to reconnect that wire so that if either of the uh, thermal cutouts, one on this side, 
The other one's over here on the other side here. There's another thermal cutout over here. But if either of these thermal cutouts goes open, it'll apply power across the light bulb and the lamp will come on. So let's hook them up. So basically it just connects to the same wire that this blue wire that's going to the thermal cutout to the switch is connected to. And that doesn't look like a very good solder job that someone's done on there, but uh, this wire is not very long. We'll solder it down to the center terminal of the switch here, which again looks like a really crappy solder job in there. I can't believe this. Somebody would actually do work like this and send this thing out. Okay, so now we're attached to the switch. I'm going to simulate the thermal cutout going open. I've I've disconnected one of the, the wires here, I'll show you. So I've disconnected one of the wires and connected it straight through a jumper. So when I turn on the power, the power light is on. If one of the thermal cutouts, because as you saw from the schematic, these are wired in series. So if I just open this wire up, the power should go off and this protection light should come on, which it does. That's what that is supposed to do. So that if you're into an over temp, condition and the amp shuts down because one of these thermal cutouts is overheated it turns on that lamp that's what it's supposed to do the fellow that brought me this amp when he bought it he bought it used and what someone had done is someone had rewired it to function as the power light because the bulb in the switch had burned out and then he got the switch replaced and the guy that replaced the switch didn't know that that was you know he, he didn't realized how it was supposed to be wired and the guy took it back and said hey this protection light keeps coming on and so what did he do he just cut the wire he didn't bother to look at it and see that it was actually there just to tell you if the uh, one of the thermal cutouts was open so now I could resolder the wire on the thermal cutout and send this one out some way because this one works I don't even need to test it any further than this this unit works I almost feel like taking this guy's sticker off here he's an embarrassment he shouldn't be allowed to advertise Shouldn't be allowed to advertise on here that he's working on this stuff because uh, there we go, there we go, the Hafler DH200 amp. Again, these were available as factory assembled and as a kit, it's comparable to the Dynacos and stuff of the era. Back up and running. I hope you enjoyed this one. Now that's a nice setup. Very cool. Very cool looking. And it actually sounds very good. I'm just using a mini disc here.